AM 650 presents You and the Law, a comprehensive look at everything you need to know about the law. Now, here's Sterling Fox. Welcome to You and the Law here on AM 650. A real pleasure to have two QCs in studio with me from the law firm Murphy Batista LLP in Vancouver. I am joined in studio by Murphy Batista, Joe Murphy and Joe Batista. Welcome to both of you, gentlemen. Well, thanks, Sterling. Good morning, Sterling. Now, Joe Murphy, you and I have met before on You and the Law. Joe Batista, it's your first occasion with us. It is, yes. So, so you draw the, the first straw, and uh, both of you gentlemen are Queen's Counsel. It's, it's fairly common in Canada to see a lawyer addressed as John Smith, or in this case, Joe Batista, QC. And we all think we know what QC means, but I'll bet you if push comes to shove and you ask too many of us, or even a few of us, we'd go, well, it's a, it's a special thing lawyers get. Yeah. Elaborate, if you would, please, Mr. QC. Um, well, um, a Queen's Council, the QC stands for Queen's Council, Correct. and it's a, a designation that's uh, given out by the Attorney General of British Columbia, and uh, it's uh, given out to uh, members of the legal profession uh, based on merit and contribution to the legal profession. Um, it does have a, a historical route that Joe can talk about, but um, each year about 20 QCs are given out, and people are nominated for, the, uh, for their QC, and then they're investigated by speaking to the Law Society, to uh, other lawyers, to judges, and then the Attorney General uh, makes his or her choice as to who should receive uh, the, the QC. And they typically come out in uh, October or November of each year. Now, Canadians uh, across the country, of course, have QCs. This is not a practice or a designation unique to British Columbia at all. Uh, it is a Canadian tradition, but each province handles its distribution of QC de designations on its own, correct? That's correct. Okay, so when did you receive yours, Joe? Uh, in 2009. Okay, so you're, you're still quite recently yeah. uh, receiving that. Now, tell us, Joe Murphy, a little bit. Now, you've been a QC uh, since the late 90s, correct? 1999, Sterling. Okay. The, the designation's interesting because it goes back to England, and in England, before a lawyer could be hired by the Queen or the King to act for them, they had to have the appointment which many, many decades ago was Casey. Okay, of course, yes. King's Council, yeah. and over the last many decades has been QC Queen's Council. So in England, you had to have that designation, which was a sign of excellence, before you could work for the king or the queen. Oh, okay. And that designation and the same ideas, uh, 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 indication of skill or excellence, got imported into Canada, and I believe it's imported into the other Commonwealth countries. So here we don't act for the king or the queen, but the designation is given out as, a, as an indication of that skill and, and that contribution. So now, interesting, now this is a complete sidebar question, but um, once Elizabeth II is no longer with us, and we presumably are dealing with a King Charles, would you become Casey's or would you retain QC? Probably QC because that's what you got when the queen was in the throne on the throne. I, right? I would think so, but uh, you've stumped me with that question, Sterling. Oh, uh, good. It's, but oh, it's good. interesting. So. <laughs> I think you'd have to go back to the early 1900s to get the answer to that. I, d I don't know. I imagine you 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 keep what you have in the new appointments. Hmm would be KC. Oh, pardon the smug smile. I, I rarely get to stump a lawyer, uh, Joe. So uh, there, good uh, question. Uh, but now tell us a little bit about Murphy Batista. Joe Batista, we've got Murphy and Batista in studio, which is, uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, Joe Batista, and your firm, please. Um, well, uh, Joe and I are classmates uh, from law school. We went to UBC, and uh, Joe was a year ahead of me in law school, and I, he got called in uh, 1976. I got called in 1977. Um, after my call to the bar, I went to work with the then Office of the Public Trustee, uh, which we can talk about later. Okay. And I was there for um, a couple of years. Uh, Joe was in private practice, and uh, uh, we had a working relationship between the public trustee and, and Joe's firm. And at uh, some point, Joe invited me to go join the firm, which I did. And uh, just about that time, personal injury law was burgeoning. There was three famous cases in the Supreme Court of Canada that uh, sort of put personal injury in a different light. And uh, Joe and I were doing a lot of personal injury cases. And then uh, at one at some point, we decided to go out on our own. 
And in 1982, uh, Joe and I started the firm of Murphy Batista with uh, the two of us and our two respective secretaries. And this, this, the idea was to dedicate the practice to personal injury law? It was. I, I think the public thinks that once you're a lawyer, you, you know all the law. And theoretically, we can practice any kind of law. But right. like in any profession, you do tend to specialize. And we can't bill ourselves as experts in personal injury law, but we do concentrate on it. And that's what we do. And so you become more efficient, you become better at it when you somewhat limit your practice. And the focus of our practice since 1982 has been personal injury of one nature or another. So, Joe Murphy, back in 18, uh, 1982, there's the two of you and your two assistants, and that's Murphy Batista. Now, take us to the uh, summer of 2013. Where's the firm these days, staff size and, and that sort of thing, relative to its humble beginnings? Well, we went from two lawyers and two secretaries in a little rented office. We rented two offices and two secretarial bays. Um, and we're now in the same place. We haven't moved, but the firm now uh, is 13 lawyers, about 45 support staff, mm -hmm. and we have 11,000 square feet. We've got a floor of one of the towers downtown, so very, very different. And the firm remains, however, completely focused on the practice of, of personal injury law. We do personal injury and related insurance claims. So we act for people against insurance companies. If someone's house burns down and the insurer won't pay them, we act for them. If someone's injured in an accident, which is far more common, a car accident, right. we act for them. But we act for people against insurance companies. Well, I, I noticed when I was uh, flipping through the website, uh, one of the areas uh, that uh, the firm uh, does uh, represent uh, clients in is medical malpractice, which, of course, can result, Joe Batista, in personal injuries from time to time. Yes. Um, medical malpractice is a very specialized area of the law. There are a few firms that that concentrate on it. We uh, do a fair amount of it. I don't myself, but uh, Joe and we have a couple of other associates in our firm that uh, do that kind of work. Um, it, it is uh, a particularly uh, tricky area. You, you know, it's not something you want to dabble in. Right. Uh, you either you are there or not. yourself. Exactly. Right. So, uh, but yes, our firm does do uh, medical malpractice. Joe Murphy, what is the bulk of the business of the firm? Is it resolving cases for people who are injured either at work or in uh, some kind of vehicle s uh, scenario? Sterling, I, I would assume or guess that 85% of our files are car accident cases. Oh, really? Okay. That's by far the more, more common. And then there's the medical malpractice cases. And there's other cases where people get injured in the most unusual circumstances. Uh, accidents happen at home. Um, accidents can happen in a bar. Um, there's just a whole variety of, of, of situations that lead to people being badly injured. And those are the people that at some point walk in our door. Okay. And uh, with that volume of business being, uh, uh, with that percentage of the volume of business being uh, dealing with car accidents and so on, then I would assume you spend a lot of time, shall we say, in conversation with ICBC? Oh, yes, for sure. That's, uh, uh, we uh, have been working with ICBC since the firm was established. Right. Because ICBC came in in 1973 or 1974. And Sterling, it, it, it surprises most people when I say this, but ICBC, I think, is the best insurance company we've ever dealt with. You've said that on this program before, and my eyebrows they, almost uh, hit the ceiling. Wait a know, second, aren't they supposed to be the enemy? Th they are, and there are times when they're unreasonable, and there's times um, when we fight uh, tooth and nail with them. Sure. But the nice thing is, if we can't deal with ICBC and settle a claim, we then go to court and let a judge or jury decide. Right. So people have choices. Now Most cases settle. 90% of our cases settle. 10% go to court. But the ability to go to court is key to us being able to, to obtain fair settlements for our clients. Right. Now, there's one little item that comes with ICBC and fighting with the insurance company. And this relates specifically to lawyers. And I'd really appreciate it, Joe, if you could if you'd flesh this out for us. Because some lawyers... Uh, not Murphy Batista by any means, but some lawyers work both sides of the street, so to speak. In some cases, they'll represent individual clients against ICBC. In other cases, they are retained by ICBC to represent that firm. And there are, there are sort of rules that lawyers who work both sides of the street have to follow that I don't know many of us uh, civilians understand completely. Well, Sterling, when ICBC hires a firm to act for them on, on a 
variety of cases, there's an agreement the firm signs with ICBC, and one of the terms of that agreement is where the firm says to ICBC, if we hire, or get hired by a client and are making a claim against you, we promise essentially we, we'll be nice. We won't threaten you uh, with a variety of things. So in a sense, to a degree, that ties their hands yeah. in acting against ICBC, and most people have no idea when they hire a lawyer that this is something that might affect how that lawyer can act for them. So I, I would think a takeaway, one takeaway here already, Joe Batista, if you're in a scenario where you're injured, you feel that you have a claim, perhaps you've been denied by an insurance company for whatever reason, and you're looking around shopping for a lawyer, one question that you should be prepared to ask any lawyer that you're going to talk to is, do you occasionally work for ICBC? Because that changes the playing field a little, doesn't it? It changes the playing field and also the client's confidence in you. I had that very question asked yesterday by a client. Do okay, you, so people are ever, smart about this. They are. Then. And, okay. and even if, if you as a lawyer think you can be objective and, and switch hats for want of a better way, yeah. the client's perception is, is that um, they're more confident having a lawyer that only acts uh, against the insurance company and never for them. Um, and Stern, I just want to follow up on something else that Joe said about ICBC being a good insurance company. The other thing is that uh, we have excellent coverage in this province compared to a lot of jurisdictions in North America. Right. Um, the minimum coverages that we have, a lot of people have in excess of the minimums, and the no-fault benefits, and the uninsured motorist protection coverage that, that's available mm -hmm. is really good compared to the rest of Canada, in fact, the rest of North America. So, uh, you know, you have to give ICBC kudos for that. We have pretty good coverage in this province. And we also have a, pa a partial package you can do. You can either insure yourself completely through ICBC or you can take the mandatory minimum coverage that it, we every British Columbia driver is required to do through I ICBC, and then you can take additional coverage from a private insurer if you want. Do most of us do that hybrid, or do most of us just do the deal with ICBC and forget about it? It's convenient. I assume most people buy with ICBC alone. Okay. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say 80% buy their entire insurance package from ICBC. Does it make a difference when, when, when there are disputes with claims and stuff, such that if, if you have uh, half or, or the uh, um, uh, voluntary half, if you will, with a private insurer and the obligatory half with ICBC, does that make your job harder when the coverage is divided like that? I, I don't believe so from my point of view, but there are subtle differences between the excess coverage you buy from ICBC and the excess coverage you buy from a private insurer. Very subtle differences. So the amount may be the same. Right. Basic ICBC is 200000 So if I'm going to buy an extra 800,000 it brings the total coverage to a million and I can buy 800 from ICBC or the extra 800 and I can buy the extra 800 from one of the private companies so the total's the same right but there are subtle differences in the policies it, you looked as though you wanted to jump in there Joe when, yeah. when we were talking about Starting, the split that yeah way. In, in my experience um, the people who split their insurance, they usually split the property damage aspect, the collision part. Yeah. They get that from another company. Mm -hmm. and, and that really doesn't, we don't get involved in that too much. Um, we're more uh, on the injury side. The, the client usually handles the property damage themselves. The so, wrecked vehicle. Exactly. Right, okay. And in my experience, that's where the parties are going to uh, uh, another insurance company for that uh, collision coverage that is sometimes a little bit cheaper, especially if they've had some accidents or they've been raided somehow. And... Uh, they shop around for that aspect of their insurance. Okay, now, Joe Murphy, you were talking about there are differences between the privately supplied insurance coverage and the public ICBC. Are those differences subtle and really inconsequential, or are they noteworthy from the point of view of what happens if? There are rare instances where the difference in coverage makes a difference to the way a claim is handled. Okay. So, but rare, maybe one in a hundred... Um, maybe one in 500. So unusual, but it can make a difference. And in those cases, the ICBC coverage is better than that provided by the private companies. All right, you're listening to You and the Law here on AM650. I'm Sterling Fox, joined in studio by Joe Murphy and Joe Batista. 
QCs both. The firm is Murphy Batista LLP online. We have to take a break. You might want to pop over to the computer while we're taking a time out and check out murphybatista.com. And by the way, Batista is B-A-T-T-I-S-T-A. Check it out, and uh, we'll be right back with more after this. This is You and the Law. There's more of the show still ahead on AM 650.